thank you everyone for being here to participate in today's event on migration and health in a global change context, the cases of Chile, Ecuador and Colombia. I am Ana Stuart Ibarra, the scientific director of the uh, IAI and it is a true honor for me to share this uh, event with our speakers and moderator today. Today we will be talking about migration and health, which is clearly a global priority. There has been an increase in migration crisis in the region. Therefore, we need this scientific institution to promote and help decision making. We believe that these topics such as the climate, health and global change interface is essential and we need to consider it as well as the, the, the evidence produced by the scientific community. So again, thank you to all the panelists who are here today. Uh, hopefully we'll have a very fruitful debate today. I would also like to welcome our moderator, Dr. Anai Urquiza, who is a member of the IAI Scientific, Scientific Advisory Committee, an academic at the University of Chile and a researcher at the Center for Climate Science and Resilience. Thank you very much, Dr. Urquiza. She's also an expert in systems theory and her research area focuses on the connection between the environment and society, especially water vulnerability, energy transitions, interdisciplinarity, governance and resilience faced with climate change. Anai, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and welcome everyone who is participating today. I believe that this is a, a great opportunity to discuss these topics because uh, migration related challenges are essential nowadays regarding global change. We see dramatic problems nowadays because the, there are wars, there are political problems, but actually this has been happening for, for many years now because uh, there are problems related to environment, environmental conflicts. And this is why we also talk about a global change when we consider the impact of the um, um, climate change, contamination, etc. Because together with political issues, this is actually uh, changing the ways in which we can live on the planet. Therefore, a large percentage of the population need to um, move to another place in order to live because their territory cannot be inhabited. This is a challenge we are experiencing nowadays but which we know will get worse until we actually manage to fully transform the way in which we connect with ecosystems, our way we, uh, how we govern ourselves in order to reach more peaceful uh, relations. Until that does not happen, we will have more and more migration processes. Uh, migration figures related to environmental causes are huge and dramatic. Uh, when we see projections, we know that probably over 200 million people will need to uh, leave their homes in order to continue existing because their current uh, places or, or land is uh, not habitable. We need to worry also about reducing the impact because nowadays the impact we have regarding climate change means that those people m might become 3 billion people at some point if we do not um, keep uh, greenhouse gases under control or other types of problems what we are doing is, in a way, forcing billions of people to uh, move around in the planet. Some migrations might be very specific and may, sometimes people can go back to their own countries, but others are permanent types of migration. And if this is so, the, the, the people migrating are affected because they need to be displaced, but also the host populations need to face uh, huge transformations. 
Therefore, this poses a huge challenge to public, the public policies in our country because we need to, um, you know, look after the, the migrants who, are, who arrive in our countries. And also, we need to strengthen systems, services in order to provide the minimum living standards to the, of the, the, the migrants and the host population as well. And this has to do also with intersectionality and how vulnerabilities overlap. Uh, you might, uh, I don't know, have some degree of disability or have uh, less money or maybe your gender is discriminated or maybe your ethnic group is discriminated as well. But imagine when that group migrates then needs to face uh, conditions which are much worse than other people's. So people do not have to face the same challenges. Therefore, we need to better understand the migrating population, the problems that we need to create, uh, the relevant public policies. Uh, of course, housing issues, uh, employment, etc. But, but the most pressing matter nowadays is health. And we need to understand how this affects the health of the migrant populations and I, we believe that the host populations need to understand this as well and this poses a great challenge for the coming years. I believe this forum is essential because we need to create more comprehensive perspectives, more research in our region and we need to understand uh, uh, the situation of the Americas in that regard. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. First of all, we have Baltica Cavieses. She's a nurse midwife with a master's degree in epidemiology from the Pontificia Universidad Católica from Chile. She has a PhD in health sciences from the University of York in England. She's a tenured professor uh, at the Social Studies and Health Program, German Clinic School of Medicine, uh, University of Development. She's a co-leader of Lands and Migration in Latin America, and national coordinator of Rechisam. She has a long a uh, background as a researcher on health inequity and migrant health. So, Baltica, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event. I am really happy to be here today sharing this time with you. I would like to discuss some of the, the items from our research study on health, on the health program. Our aim is to create new knowledge on social processes that impact population and community health and its effective transfer to promote social equity in health in Chile and Latin America. Our main lines of work are interdisciplinary research and we work, I have been working since 2008 in this regard. It is uh, a pleasure to be here co-leading Lancet Migration Latin America as well in this uh, uh, platform. First of all, historically speaking, uh, we've had peop foreign people living in Chile for over 100 years. So have a look at these data. Around 2000 and 2005, there was a breaking point in Chile and uh, migrants, uh, we had around 2% two, around two migrants, but that figure increased significantly. And nowadays, we have a, an estimate of 8%. This increase of foreigners living in Chile has created a change in population uh, dynamics, demographic profiles, epidemiological profiles, and also human interaction, and uh, also the social uh, customs regarding the health system in Chile. Also, the total Chilean population has increased. Chile, Chile's population has increased. Have a look at this graph, the red line during the same period. And in blue, you have the curve that we had seen compared to the total population. So we need to see this in absolute terms terms with the curve as well, but we need to consider the change in the last few years because there has been a strong inflow. In the 70s, this country had mainly 
um, sent migrants to other continents and countries because of political uh, dictatorship reasons and economic reasons as well. However, uh, we, we, we haven't reached the 10% percent migration percent, uh, percentage, but of course this, uh, this 80 percent has already uh, many things in Chile. According to the National Statistics Institute, the most recent data uh, from lower to higher shows that Venezuela has replaced the, the top country in Chile, Peru. Uh, because they were the highest number of migrants for over a century. And, but Venezuela is now number one, and they uh, account for one third of the total number of migrants. After that, Peru, Bolombia, Argentina, Ecuador, etc. There is a strong country pattern regarding intra-regional south-south uh, migration. There are inter-regional displacements within the southern cone and a quick change because of the Venezuelan humanitarian exodus that has created changes. And there, it has affected the whole southern cone and Latin America as well, including Chile, although we are six months away on foot uh, from uh, Venezuela, but we still get, uh, get the migration. As I said before, these, these uh, diverse and heterogeneous migration and human dynamics with different countries of origin, different types of health needs, health systems, cultures, uh, world visions, etc. In this context, and very recently, the last government adopted the latest migration law in Chile that replaces the 1975 one, which was fully outdated and was not relevant to today's reality. Now, this one includes several human rights issues, uh, including an, an, an item about health, and this needs to be reflected on, its, uh, on the migration policy. Um, of course, over 6 million Venezuelans have left their country, and there is also the humanitarian and health crisis caused by the COVID pandemic, which has uh, closed down some borders, and this has caused changes in Latin America. Um, and also, some countries have remained close to others. Regarding global change, uh, environmental change and migration, I would like us to have a systemic approach. Of course, it's not the only one, but we need to think about the social determinants of health, where we can have this rainbow perspective to see various dimensions and levels or layers of the how the lives of everyday people are affected when they get up in the morning, go to work, go to study, and how that uh, impacts the results of the health disease processes in communities and populations. Therefore, we have the individual level in the middle, the community, and then we have the, the wider perspectives. And here we can include, of course, global change and climate change. This is a 1990 uh, model by Danvena Whitehead. It has been changed, of course, but it's very uh, useful. It helps us see the different layers that create specific vulnerabilities, and at the same time, they create specific needs. Uh, I would like to quote uh, Florencia Luna. She says, in the logics of intersectionality, she talks about vulnerability layers. The metaphor of a stratum, a layer, um, uh, gives the idea of something softer, but it's not a compact and single vulnerability. These layers or strata may overlap. In some cases, they are related to informed consent issues, others to social circumstances, to uh, rights problems, gender, poverty, etc. And we need to uh, address each specific context in, in order to understand every case. Adela Cortina talks about this global justice within the, uh, 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 in a very recent book published last year, she talks about the importance of thinking uh, again about a global society, uh, connected humankind, uh, beyond what we thought until now. And we need to think about the ethics of care, the capacity to care uh, makes us human beings, the ethics of responsibility globally, 
and humans are, are ready for this and they they can be altruistic and also the ethics of cordiality respect for dignity compassion for vulnerable beings on all, on the layers and times of life uh, during a person's life I would like to share with you some examples taken from two studies because we don't have much time but I think they might whet your appetite for a further uh, study number one a study conducted on four borders of the region Irene and Andres are also part of the study we have conducted a qualitative survey on borders and we have detected layers of vulnerability of this intersectionality among children uh, especially uh, children and adolescents that are that have no adults uh, looking after them also pregnant women young women or young women with children or also cases of xenophobia and finally I would like to take a like to talk about very painful situations which we might understand as violence in a context recognized as democratic or peaceful this is the Atacama Desert in the north where people where Venezuelans and people from other countries are entering the country this is like uh, people are, uh, are crossing the border on foot a study was conducted and it identified the intersectionality woman uh, childhood and migration and crossing a border uh, during the pandemic through an unauthorized entry point have a look at this quote I arrived at the Chilean border after crossing the Atacama Desert with my two children we were quickly approached by two soldiers holding big guns in their hands they made a mock execution by pointing their guns at us and counting to three before shooting once they stopped counting they burst out laughing oh you bought it they said my children started crying and I panicked this happened months ago and my boys still wake up crying at night saying they're gonna kill us so this is what's happening in real time uh, on the border of our territory and we need to really address the the reasons for migration including global change and also the intersectionality of vulnerability layers suffered by this person I would like to highlight the importance of several priority uh, uh, methodologies you can read them in order to protect human rights and their dignity and for resources and to have real integration in order to work with host societies uh, this is our website saludimigrantes.cl I would also like to invite you to uh, to know Lancet Migration Latin America thank you very much Thank you, Baltica, for this presentation. Now I would like to hear Irene Torres, who researches health promotion at Fundación Octaedro. She is a member of the board of the Ecuadorian Society of Public Health and a member of the International Council of the Global Society for Migration, Ethnicity, Race and Health. She has conducted studies on school, food, health implementation and capacity, community participation, decision making and migration and health in general. Irene, you have the floor. I will let you know when you have a few minutes left. Thank you, Anaï. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Thank you for the interest in this um, research topic that brings, but that has brought Baltic Andres and I together, and we keep working in this area, and hopefully, we'll continue to work on the in the area for 2023. I will focus on Ecuador from Fundación Octaedro, uh, which is my institution for this project. They've been working since 1995 in arts, sciences, and letters. We have conducted studies in rural, rural areas, marginal urban areas, and we, for instance, have participated in creating local committees in uh, medium-sized uh, cities in Ecuador, and we also research and do advocacy work in education and health this is very similar to what Baltica has said and I'm sure that you will see this in Andres's uh, study as well actually the Venez the, we had um, Venezuelan migrants increased quickly uh, something like in Ecuador there will be around 17 million uh, people 
uh, sorry, for this is the figure for 2021. It is estimated that we have 500,000 Venezuelans in Ecuador, so around 3% of Ecuador's total population uh, includes the sudden arrival of a uh, large-scale migration from Venezuela in recent years. Uh, this record, and this is also important, it's not complete because they enter the country through irregular borders. There is a, a high rate of uh, rise, a high circulation rate, but this shows us that most uh, migrants are young. The population has a, a, a male-female balance, and there are tens of thousands of underage children, many of them born in Ecuador. And this is an estimated uh, census because it is uh, only the uh, a specific sen uh, census. What happens with people uh, coming from Ecuador, uh, from Venezuela to Ecuador? And this is similar to what happens in other countries. What key informants have told us that they have the same consequences as uh, 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 that appear in the host country. They have, they, they have the same problems. But actually, my, uh, migrants find it very hard to find a job that provides uh, social welfare benefits. So, we can, and that is a case of professionals. What happens with migrants who are not professionals, uh, who don't have a, a trade or a profession? It's even harder. Before the pandemic, 2019 survey 13.4 had uh, looked after one or more children, adolescents. 42% stated that they do not go to school or college, and 60% of them uh, did not attend because they didn't have the necessary financial resources. Therefore, these children or adolescents are affected because of the lack of money. And also regarding intersectionality, if the idea is to provide the, the necessary means, for instance, this is the result. Uh, the children, almost half the children and adole uh, adolescents do not attend an educational institution. So what has happened re regarding health? Um, I think Ecuador, Ecuador mainly has not uh, done anything. The Ministry of Health, the government hasn't done much in order to actually provide a health response regard within the humanitarian response. It, it's very fragmentary. There's an, an NGO network, there's a UN system, you know, UNFPA, UNHCR, etc. But there is no true intersectionality. Of course, the limited uh, public resources are also limited. And this is reflected because services are isolated um, events. Regarding uh, public insurance, which maybe doesn't seem to be so important, but if only 40% of the people in Ecuador do have uh, social security, then non-members affect the system. Nowadays, we have 500,000 people that were not expected to use the health system. Therefore, the Ecuadorian system depends to a great extent on private uh, uh, Expen expenditure, if the people do not have the income, if there is no health response, how can they have access to health services? Uh, and can you imagine that 50% uh, of the private expenses are allocated to uh, medication and not to health care in itself? This was a, a very extreme situation. Here there is a very interesting phenomenon because it all depends on uh, when you interview the key informants. When they arrived, 2017, 2019, uh, people were provided with health. Have a look at this. 2017, um, Venezuelan people, 4,489, the, the number of consultations. But, but when uh, figures increase and they leave the borders and they now live with the Ecuadorian population, this decreases dramatically. Ecuador uh, 
has actually uh, 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 re actually recovered in 2019 and we're now collecting 2020 and 2021 uh, information but actually in 2018 the ba not even basic basic health care was provided this is actually primary care services maybe uh, you know taking blood pressures uh, um, referring patients the thing is that in uh, Ecuador in Ecuador we don't have a, an electronic clinical record other conditions for instance the UNHCR in 2018 estimated that 40 percent of the migrant population was at risk of sexual violence uh, we don't have the data on the true impacts but the risk is huge according to the IOM survey 74 percent of Venezuelan migrants had suffered stress or emotional distress that year 2019 and 60 percent of them uh, had not uh, sought help so there is the issue of access of coverage of accessibility regarding sex violence it has a huge impact on the mental health of uh, uh, girls young women and women it can affect sex and reproductive health as you may know Ecuador in Ecuador abortion is illegal in most cases including after uh, rape therefore we have a, a huge gender-based problem finally I think I'm doing well with time and I how much time do I have left one okay one minute yes uh, sorry I was going so fast sorry to the interpreter um, as I was saying at the beginning actually uh, you know economic uh, inclusion is the most important thing migrants need to have resources and they need to find jobs even if they're uh, university professionals even if they have been included in the uh, system and they can exercise their professions here of course there has been an economic uh, downturn a lot of social and political unrest in 2019 also the borders um, were closed because of the pandemic so now we have new data I think all of this has had a huge impact for instance uh, COVID diagnosis the figures showed that migrants were diagnosed either negative or positive at a much lower rate than Ecuadorians and they couldn't actually exercise their political rights because there were formal lockdowns and so many restrictions per provinces etc on account of the pandemic therefore there is this intersectional aggravating factor which affects migrants uh, even more in Ecuador thank you very much Thank you, Irene, for the presentation. And I would like to say that the uh, you can leave your comments and questions in the chat so that after uh, Andres Cubillo's uh, presentation, we can have a, a debate. Andres Cubillo is Director of Research at the Institute of Public Health of the Pontificia Universidad Javariana. He holds a postdoctoral degree in mental health from the University of Central Florida and a PhD in International Intercultural Studies. He is a member of Lancet Migration and coordinator of the Migration and Health Network. He has conducted a, a, a extensive research and publications uh, and made publications in migration and health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anaí. Thank you. Uh, my co thank you colleagues because I really value your presentations and also the great friends who have worked throughout this process I would like to share with you this presentation I have I have prepared for today uh, I do I, I am keeping time here okay so uh, an alarm might go off at some point well I would like to talk about the case of uh, the uh, Ven Venezuelan migration to Colombia and I would like to talk to you about a study we conducted uh, because very the 
a very interesting analysis has been conducted among the Venezuelan population in uh, f uh, Florida. Um, and also there is this intersectionality aspect, which is very interesting. First of all, and as Baltic and Irene had said before me, this has this migration has taken place on foot and it's usually families who come from Venezuela. This is not a, an individual uh, migration and it's not just, you know, the a woman or a man that migrate, it's mostly families migrating. Colombia has over 2,000 kilometers of uh, borders with Venezuela and they are a neighboring country, so we are the country that has uh, welcomed uh, the, the highest number of Venezuelans. And this is a porous uh, border. In this migration process, pe the, these people just w walk into the country. country. Therefore, this uh, border uh, access has been different to the uh, and of course this has provided them with access to the north of the continent and and there is also migration into uh, the united states not directly but through aruba therefore these people who migrate enter the state but through aruba and that's uh, some uh, a very important factor that affects the migration process rights frameworks etc which we can analyze later on Migration data, 6 million Venezuelans living abroad, according to the R4MV platform. Mo many of them request uh, refuge. The thing is that with this request is that it has been de denied by many countries, which, ha which has complicated um, the, the stay in the host country. In Colombia, this is a sort of fennel type of uh, funnel type of immigration. Now, before the pandemic, we had 36,000 people entering the country, 32,000 leaving the country. Therefore, we have this uh, huge flow. On the border, we have 4 million inhabitants in Venezuela and Colombia. Given the context of the pandemic and the Bo uh, border uh, problems, this has decreased the migration flows. However, the population that reaches the south of the continent is not the same type of population that reaches Colombia on an everyday basis. This shows the records of the population living in Colombia, which is not the same as the pendular uh, migration flow we have as a country. In this context, and since uh, uh, between 2014 and 2016, we had the migrants that had some specific uh, unstable financial um, conditions. But this began to change in 2017 and has until today. Most of the people migrating from Venezuela are more vulnerable, they are poor, and there is strong detachment from the country as well. Of the 1,800,000 people uh, who are from Venezuela but are in Colombia, of course, there are some problems with the uh, protection protocol, but I will develop this later on. Uh, the population has been regularized through, through different uh, methodologies, the uh, mobility card, the protocol, etc. Why is this important? Because it has allowed us uh, to provide people access to health, which really interests us, because there are some problems to access health services when you do not have a residence permit, for instance. In 2020, we conducted a study and we asked why the people were uh, actually arriving in uh, various countries, but especially Colombia, we found that 85% uh, 
cited political and social factors. I won't delve into this, and of course, uh, economic issues because of the first ones. And the social factors include health services. So that's like their first need and why they want to uh, migrate to another country because they need access to um, health services. According to various studies which we have analyzed, the origin transit uh, in the origin transit and destination, the access to health services, access to health services is limited. And this becomes a health social determinant. In this intersectionality, this has mostly affected vulnerable uh, people, women and children, mainly. Colombia has uh, made huge efforts to uh, actually help uh, my, migrants legally. Of course, we can improve our work. Um, this is a timeline that I can briefly show you. We have focused on this population in order to cater to their needs along the borders and in some cities uh, reached by these migrants, Bogotá, Medellín, Barranquilla and Cali. As I was saying, I would like to uh, share some results we have achieved, what has happened in some other contexts in relation to the mental health of these uh, people. As Irene was saying, uh, the mental health of Venezuelans, um, we can say that they do not have access to mental health services, not because, they're, just because there are barriers, but because they are not aware of the mental health services they can have access to and also because mental health is still considered a taboo. How does this Im impact mental health? Discrimination, cultural shock, uh, if they go to the States they don't know the language, socioeconomic uh, conditions, family and social relations and also not knowing what's happening with a population that uh, stayed within the, uh, Venezuela because they, 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 they still live there. There is, well, also job uncertainty and, and uh, uncertainty about the future. Some challenges, I know I don't have much time left. So some challenges of the 5 million Venezuelan migrants in, in the world, Colombia accounts for 36%. Since the beginning of this exodus, Venezuelans in the country have had worse health conditions uh, because of barriers to access to health services. And in many cases, these conditions or barriers also uh, appear in Colombia. Uh, no access to food and job uh, insecurity. Venezuelan migrants in the Venezuelan migrants interviewed reported having barriers to access to health services in Colombia because of what I said, uh, especially because of the lack of the residence permit. Therefore, Colombia has worked a lot, but we need to improve our response. International cooperation has been very important as well. But we need to consider that healthcare, not just in Colombia, but in Ecuador, in Chile as well, needs to be agreed on in a way, or, or at least debated, so that people, can, so that governments, uh, uh, so that governments can have joint uh, strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. So uh, now we have a few minutes to ask questions. Uh, maybe we can, you know, uh, complement your presentations. We do have already several questions. I would like to start with Carlos Barbosa's question addressed to Irene. Which policies have been updated to validate different uh, degrees so that professionals can work in their fields and have access to the social and health services? I'm sure this is also a question that is uh, that is relevant for Chile and Colombia as well. Another question, Patricia uh, Lewis saying that in the context of the pandemic, 
what is happening to um, with the access of you know refugees and migrants to uh, vaccines and are they included in the national immunization plans are there relevant initiatives in this regard which might help us uh, reflect on the issue also I would like to ask you if part of the information we already have on the living conditions of migrants. Uh, let us know how this maybe creates xenophobia in these contexts because of these these uh, clashes between the, the the migrants and the host population, especially consider, considering high levels of informality, employment issues, and also health services issues that we might have in our countries. So shall we start with that round of questions? And then if there is time, then we might uh, ask further questions. There are so many questions. OK, so first Carlos and then Andres and Baltica can talk about uh, uh, immunizations. Uh, uh, we, are, we are part of the Andres Becho program, so it's not that difficult to validate degrees. In the interviews I conducted, I saw that most of them could actually exercise their professions, and that was not an issue. There is, there is a problem maybe with the market, and there is xenophobia as well, of course, and there are cases, and some people could not validate their degrees because, um, you know, the, the, uh, the consular affairs in Venezuela are quite problematic. They don't have the documents, they're not updated, they are not sent from Venezuela. And that really, that is a true problem. Regarding vaccines, uh, Ecuador has worked a lot, especially regarding uh, uh, smallpox. Uh, but there was never a vaccination actually uh, program because, sorry, this was, uh, and children were, I don't know, vaccinated. Sorry, this was uh, measles and not smallpox. But of course, we need to vaccinate children once and again when they enter the country. And uh, regarding COVID, they were uh, vaccinated against COVID in Ecuador. And we have even talked about making the, uh, the vaccine obligatory because this is what they are requesting in several places. Therefore, uh, we, we are vaccinating uh, migrants uh, to protect, protect them from COVID. Thank you. Baltica? Thank you, Anaí. Carlos asked a question and he talks about borders are always far away from capitals. And he says something, he quotes something. In the last two years, we have had overlapping crises. And they, of course, can be understood as problems or uh, crisis. There is a Venezuelan problem, the COVID pandemic and the borders. There is a social, cultural, political, economic crisis in some countries, which is also related to climate change uh, because it does affect migrants as well. Uh, and of course, some people need to leave their countries because of desertification, massive droughts or agricultural issues. And if we uh, think about that and borders, we need to rethink which are the borders we have drawn as a region. And second, what we should do with these borders uh, uh, on the issue of public policy or, or which public policy gaps we have regarding borders uh, for our population and for other populations which we define as different from us. And it also uh, provides or invites us to provide a more uh, cooperative view. And we need to think about health services as well. I believe that both topics have problems nowadays regionally regarding health and migration. They have a strong impact 
on global, cha uh, uh, global change that needs or requires further analysis. Regarding COVID, very early on uh, in Chile, there was a debate uh, through a health uh, regulation that stated that this was at the end of February uh, in the year uh, of 2021. The regulation said that migrants that had a valid visa or valid uh, status could actually access uh, vaccines as the population did, but this was not the case if their situation or status was irregular. And this actually created the, the reaction of several civil society organizations and academic organizations and institutes. Uh, open letters were written, uh, scientific evidence was provided regarding restricting vaccination. Therefore, the protocol included irregular migrants as well. And this is the status, the current status uh, regarding COVID vaccination in Chile. Um, but remember, I talked about borders and the challenges of having a regional perspective. These overlap here as well with the example provided by Irene. Regarding borders, there are several efforts are being made by the civil society, Chile Crece Contigo, UNICEF, um, the WHO, uh, PAHO, UNFPA, etc., and civil society organizations, the government. They're all trying to respond to what is happening in the northern border in Chile, which has actually, uh, which is more serious than we would ever have expected. Uh, socially and in the area of health. Thank you, Baltica. Uh, other questions have been asked, uh, especially addressed to Colombia. One has to do with uh, self, uh, sexual health protection uh, for uh, for women migrants from Venezuela, and also what happens. At the, uh, with the migration of the, the, the Darien uh, jungle? Has the government done anything specific or have they worked together with Panama in this regard as well? Okay, I'll, I'll take these, uh, these questions then first. Yes, it's so many questions. Um, regarding uh, sexual and reproductive health, the country has implemented strategies, especially uh, uh, for birthing mothers. We need to remember that uh, healthcare barriers uh, appear not because of nationality, but because of vulnerability issues. And we need to address that. As I said in my presentation, we we're getting more people uh, from Venezuela who are vulnerable, and that creates this a major barrier. We have conducted studies, especially in the city of Barranquilla, where there is a high demand for sexual and reproductive health services. The studies have shown us that the nationality component, um, for instance, someone can come from another country, they can work and access certain social benefits. Um, but their nationality does not affect or does not create a barrier. So if they're Venezuelan, they can access services anyway. So Colombian, both Colombian and Venezuelan women who are vulnerable have the, exactly the same barriers to health services. It's important to say this. Regarding what is happening at the Darien Plague or Tapón de Darien, this is a truly complex jungle. Uh, it is a place that has armed groups, uh, re rebel groups who are violent not just in Colombia, but also in Panama. This has uh, hugely impacted, uh, you know, this uh, migration. 
migration is usually on foot in the area and there's something we haven't uh, addressed people have disappeared in the migration process and, and the rate is really high with Venezuelans and it is because of this crossing the border uh, into Panama and the northern section of the continent although most Venezuelans do not go to the United States along this uh, through this border some of them have and we see this uh, problem for uh, Haitian people uh, Cuban people and people from Asia, uh, Asia and Africa as well this is a huge problem that has not been fully addressed and we need to uh, develop the necessary care social security policies because it's such a terrible issue people get lost and they need to uh, really sustain terrible conditions in a migration process that should be humane. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. We have a few minutes and I would like to uh, actually mention a topic that appears in several of the other questions. We won't have time to answer every question but we can uh, write emails to you and we can answer the questions in that way. But several questions address uh, the issues of the environment and the climate. Uh, there, of course, there is a huge political crisis in Venezuela, but besides that, it, I'm sure you, know, you do have information about um, migrants that actually have left their country because of an environmental or climate related issue. Especially when we think about internally displaced people, for instance, in Chile because of drought, etc. So that question came up in several uh, questions actually. And also, do you uh, are you aware of any maybe uh, uh, things in common in the legislation of our different countries? Because there might be uh, adaptation efforts that we can make the most of. So uh, let's have one more round. Please be brief so that we can finish on time. Thank you, Anai. Yesterday we participated in the presentation of the uh, IPCC report. Someone mentioned Ecuador and said and asked if climate change was causing migration in Ecuador or the other way around. And this is interesting because with Andres and Baltica we have explored the connections between migration and climate change in the region and we'd like to uh, further analyze the intersection. In Cañar, Ecuador, this, the phenomenon is actually the opposite because uh, many people are leaving Cañar outside Ecuador and there, is the, there are remittances and the, uh, and the uh, economy uh, uh, has changed and this is causing an environmental change in at the, in the province of Cañar and this is like the opposite phenomenon and, and it has really called our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Baltica, thank you for all the questions and comments in the chat. I've really enjoyed reading them. Sometimes you're tempted to simplify reality and to, you know, pull out which dimension of climate change impacts uh, migrations and to what extent. And the thing is that research is about creating uh, this knowledge in social and global environments that are multidimensional and they are very complex and difficult to understand and measure. For instance, the Haitian population that has ar arrived in Chile, they left Haiti I don't know, 10 years ago because of a massive earthquake, natural resources, etc. And all of this is related to climate change. They reach Chile, they settle down, 
many times they have a formal or informal job. Sometime later, the government changes in, in the United States and there is a, an apparent open border policy. And from Chile, they uh, walk up to uh, Mexico uh, to enter the United States and they suffer xenophobia, um, you know, many uh, violence and many are murdered. And many of them they, uh, uh, need to return to Chile. There, therefore, there are, of course, global scale political processes, economic processes, and humane uh, treatment. These are, uh, and the environment as well. This is all uh, very much connected, and we need further research uh, in the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. First of all, thank you for the question because I think that. Uh, regarding climate change, migration is an essential component. Two aspects. Number one, we need to analyze how people, given the same climate change conditions, same problems, decide to stay, to stay in their countries. So we need to think about that as well uh, regarding public policies. Also, we need to remember something regarding climate change. And the FAO report states, talks about food insecurity and nutritional insecurity that is also happening because of climate change. This is creating a, a condition of vulnerability in Colombia, especially in rural areas, in uh, specific uh, in indigenous groups or that have some cultural differences. This is why we need to think about intersectionality and also uh, the social determinants of health and the living conditions of those populations that unfortunately have poorer conditions. And we need to hear their voices and acknowledge what they are doing in order to protect their territory and culture because there's something very interesting uh, we need to think about what governments do and what you know grassroots uh, uh, people do thank you Andres thank you Irene Baltica thank you for asking questions this is a, a topic we're now just beginning to unravel and there are many things that include the causes of that explain migration, the solutions we need to implement. Uh, we need a comprehensive perspective. And we have a huge challenge from the, uh, uh, that requires interdisciplinary work. Uh, different areas need to work together. And we also need to work with decision makers in order to act collectively so that research is available to decision makers. And as Andres was saying, uh, we need to work with communities as well because they're looking for ways to adapt to these changes and we need to make a huge effort in order to uh, implement this knowledge and we need to do this for the future and to make this knowledge available to these populations. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we will continue meeting and working together in the short, uh, mid and long term. So we'll be in touch. Anna, on behalf of the IAI, I would like to thank you, Anaí, Irene, Andres, and Baltica. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for sharing this relevant information. And thank you for guiding this fascinating debate. Thank you to the participants for the questions. Uh, the topics addressed today present several challenges uh, to many countries in the Americas. Americas. And the scientific information is a necessary input in order to guide decision making to face this crisis. We'd like to share this recording with everyone who has enrolled and we're going to answer the questions we haven't been able to address during the event. Okay, we'll answer by email. Um, I wish you a great, great rest of the day. We'll see each other in the next IAI event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.